Hi, my name is Sunil Nagaraj. I'm a VC with Bessemer Venture Partners, and excited to have everyone here. We've got a great panel, and we've got, I think, a, a really interesting topic today. Uh, the way I interpret it, and I think what we'll spend a lot of time, uh, 30 minutes uh, today on, is uh, how important is mobile, the mobile paradigm, the mobile interface, mobile devices, to adoption of wearable devices. Uh, if you break away from that, why, why would you break away? What are the benefits, and is it kind of a long-term break or a temporary break? So with that, uh, I'll have the panel introduce themselves, each for about uh, kind of two or three sentences about uh, your role at the company and kind of your company's product. Uh, so Yobi, would you like to start us off? Hi, my name is Yobi Benjamin. I'm co-founder of a firm called Avigant. To those of you who have the opportunity, please visit us. We have a small exhibit table upstairs. And Avigant is a, we, pr we create a head mount, what, the category is called the head mounted display. We prefer to call it a convergence, uh, convergent uh, entertainment system. And that means you get a ultra high quality headphone, audio headphone, active and passive noise cancellation, 360 audio. And in one click, you get to see high definition video. You bring it up, all audio. You bring it down, you have TV. We're very different from Google Glass because we have, or Oculus. Um, we have, the system that differentiates us is you actually know where your hands are. You can see your hand, you can look around. So there's full situational awareness. Our product works with all games that exist today and all movies that exist today. And I'll add one or two things to that. Uh, so the unit, Avagon Glyph, it's $500 and it's shipping at the beginning of next year. Yes. Right. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, just want to make sure we cover everything. Monisha. I'm Monisha Prakash, co-founder and CEO of Lumo Body Tech. And we are closing the gap where technology meets fashion. Our most recent product is a very stylish posture and activity tracker. I'm wearing one now. It looks like a brooch or lapel pin. We offer a variety of designs and colors. And how it works is it tracks your body's movements to a very high degree of resolution. And when you slouch, the sensor will vibrate to remind you to straighten up. It also transmits wirelessly data to your smartphone and tracks your steps, calories, and distance traveled. And that's uh, what, $80 and you sold over 15,000 already? So we're currently selling it for 79 on pre-order. We're gonna start shipping soon, at which time it'll become $99. We did do a one month crowdfunding campaign and in that month we raised over $1.2 million uh, and sold over 16,000 units. Wow, fantastic. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, I'm Tan Lee. I'm founder and CEO of a company called Emotive. Uh, we're a bioinformatics company that's focused on bringing EEG measurement or electroencephalography or measuring your brain waves from the clinic and the labs into the real world, into everyday life. And so uh, we have two products. One is a scientific contextual EEG, which is really not designed for consumers. That's designed to provide a contextualized um, information about how your brain is changing in real time um, in, in any sort of contextual study. So whether it be you know, walking through a shopping center or a supermarket or being able to trek up a mountain and look at oxygen depletion in the brain or whether we're doing the studies with NASA around you know, Mars analog missions and seeing how cognitive load affects people's abilities to perform and function. Um, as, but what we're doing, uh, in addition to this scientific contextual EEG, is coming out with a consumer product called the Emotive Insight. This product we crowdfunded last year on Kickstarter, and we already also raised just over $1.6 million, uh, and that product's coming out at the end of this year for $299. That's great. That's awesome. All three, all three companies here have done very well on Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. yeah. We ourselves, we did a million and a half. Yeah. In Kickstarter, it's amazing how the crowd really matters now mm -hmm. to your com to all of uh, to these startups, to all yes. these startups. Millionaires Club, Kickstarter the Millionaires, millionaires Club. Club. <laughs> yep, yep. There's, there's not a lot of them, by the way, in no. the Millionaires Club. Yeah. Right. We actually did our crowdfunding on our own website, and I'm also happy to talk about why we decided to do that versus Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. yeah, I mean, let alone I mean, there's the, the financial component of having cash to sort of sign up contract manufacturers, but also as an investor. Uh, that's a great signal for us to see sort of pre-orders. I think all the wearables we've done have had strong pre-order sales. So it's great to see product market fit in advance of 
devoting a lot of capital. Interestingly enough for us, our pre-orders, we're now at, a, at Kickstarter was only 3,500, right? And now we're now up to almost 20,000 mm -hmm. at this point. And we treated that differently mm. than the Kickstarter one mm -hmm. in terms of getting the cash. Yeah. It's a little different. So, um, Monisha, I'd like to start with you. Uh, the Lumo, can you show us the, the whole unit sure. here? So, so the part you see is the magnetic clasp. The part that you don't see is hiding. It magnetically attaches. Um, so this is the sensor. So it's very thin, very lightweight, and it hides behind your clothing. And the clasp is magnetic, as I said. So what you see is the clasp. And you can activate the sensor a little Star Trek Trekkie, but by through taps. <laughs> cool. Nice. So let me ask you, um, could we were, you know, the topic of the panel is breaking away from mobile. Could this have been accomplished with just a mobile phone or with the upcoming smartwatch or smart glasses? Um, no, it really could not because what we're doing is we're tracking your body's movements, particularly a, around the core, because obviously your core of your body is related to your posture. And so it would be very difficult to do that simply from you know, a phone or from a wrist-worn um, watch or even glasses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is for the broader panel. Um, do you foresee mobile phones or smartwatches having any role for your company going forward, or is it all reliant on proprietary hardware? Uh, for us, um, the f currently our product is a wired product, a single wire uh, connection to any device. So our device right now works with the PlayStation, the Xbox, the iPhone, the iPad, the Android phone, any device. Mm -hmm. So in cases where it, the, the, mobili the mobile aspect is not a requirement for us. Uh, future generations, we have Wi-Fi, low power Bluetooth, we have LTE. So in certain conditions, it would be, it would be helpful, but it's not a requisite, at least for our product. When we think about our solutions, there's sort of two components. There's the uh, part that collects the data, and then there's the part that displays the data, right? And so the sensor has to be on the body, particularly the core, to collect the data. But how we display that data, you know, there, it's, it, the, the sky's the limit. You know, whether it's a Google Glass or, you know, a wrist-worn um, smartwatch or your or a website, you know, your desktop. Our device is a little bit different. So the way that we see the world is that for the longest time, you can tr people have, you know, the last few decades, we've started to care about tracking physical health because we realize that that's the, the key to living, you know, a healthy, better life. Uh, we're living longer lives. The, there's never been a, the possibility for normal, everyday consumers to track your cognitive health and performance as well. And so the way we see um, the insight and products like that is that you can use that in conjunction with a, a watch that tracks your physical activity, but you can also look at how that correlates with your mental performance. And by doing that, you're getting a, a much more comprehensive view of your health. So health is no longer just one dimensional. It's not just about physical health, which is obviously very important, but it's also about cognitive health and performance and how do the two um, you know, correlate with each other. So if you're going out for a 30 minute walk, or run every day, how does that affect your attention levels, your ability to focus, how long does that effect last? You can get much better uh, metrics on that and how well you're sleeping at night. So some of these metrics haven't been available to an everyday consumer in the past. So we don't see it as, it, it's, our product is not something that you can measure non-invasively at a distance, like with a capacitive sensor. So you can't take your phone to your brain and say, wow, what's my brain doing at this point? You can't quite do that. And so you do need to wear some sort of device on your head, but I think that some of these other companion products can be used uh, to complement that data stream to provide much more useful contextual data uh, and can also be provided as a, a, vi a visual feedback as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, Tan, um, you touch on something that's really interesting, and I think the day when our data can live together and not be in silos, I mean, mm -hmm. Wow, wouldn't it be neat to see the correlation between posture and you know attention and, yeah, and focus and concentration, mm -hmm. right? And to be able to show that you know good posture actually does increase concentration, right? right? And 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 you could just and that's just one of like just infinite examples of how once our data can start you know living together and sort of you know be more strongly correlated, 
um, how, how the space could get a lot more interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in our case, uh, in the Glyph's case, um, other than the fact that you see a video signal and an audio signal, we also have pulse ox sensors in the, in the device. Mm -hmm. We also have galvanic sensors in the device. We also have pupil dilation monitors on the device. So what happens is you can have a two-way conversation with potentially a filmmaker and say, as you watch a horror movie and we notice that you're not scared enough, <laughs> they can change the scene for you <laughs> and basically pump up the volume and uh, put in a different scene. Introduce your own heart rate too, yeah, right? Yeah, increase <laughs> your own heart rate, yeah. yeah. But again, I like the idea of like some convergence of all of this data mm -hmm. somewhere, some and I, you know, some middle layer of sorts. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right now, the only thing from speaking like an engineer, the only thing that I see as a common denominator is the, the data format for Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have one, but you know, they could be, the data format is just about it. Yeah, so I want to dive a lot more, uh, more deeply into that particular topic of sort of open APIs and, and getting at your data. I think it has more to do with um, Emotive uh, and Lumo, uh, but there's one train of thought that says that hardware will eventually get commoditized and the real winner will be the one that has the consumer's attention. So uh, in that world, do you buy that argument? And if so, um, do you worry about giving out your data so that another player sort of is the one that's the consolidator that has all the consumer attention? I think um, in our case, the nature of the data is not something that is simple enough for people to just take. It's not movement data. It's not um, text that you can aggregate and have some sort of nat natural language processing in order to try and figure out what that unstructured data means. EEG data is something that is quite specific. It's very unique. There's a lot of noise artifact that's superimposed onto the data. And so it takes a sophisticated amount of pro signal processing, classifiers, machine learning algorithms in order to tease out the unique features from that data set. And so, there is a, that's why we call ourselves a bioinformatics company. Of course, the input layer is very important. You need a hardware device that has really high uh, signal quality in order to have good inputs. But what is the underlying value in this business over time is the ability to provide far more valuable, dense information about the brain, about performance, about health, um, about behavior. And th I, I think that's something that is not very easily commoditized, mm -hmm. at least insofar as EEG data is, mm -hmm. is concerned. Mm -hmm. I wholeheartedly agree with that. We see ourselves as a software and data company, mm -hmm. and the hardware is simply a hook to be able to collect that data. Uh, but the data by itself is meaningless still. Like You have to know how to translate that data into insights and into actionable feedback for the user that's relevant for the user. We're a little different on the software side. We see ourselves in, in some of the future releases as a content creation company. So we enable the creation of dynamic, specialized content mm -hmm. in, in a head-mounted display type of an environment. Mm -hmm. So software is important for us, but what's more important is the creation of content that people will consume. Mm -hmm. If you don't have anything to consume, it doesn't really make for a device. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to watch. Okay, so uh, interesting points on data, but on, on the defensibility, do you, any of you worry a, about um, hardware knockoffs, uh, lower cost sort of alternatives, uh, using an outsourced manufacturer that maybe uh, eventually begins to do it themselves or helps another competitor? These are the physical things that most internet startups have no idea you, these problems even exist. I think yeah. it's very different. It <laughs> yeah. depends on the hardware. So there are portions of our hardware that could potentially be generic. Um, but I think in our particular case, one of the most difficult aspects of brain sensing is spatial resolution. So a lot of companies that focus on brainwave sensing focus on the forehead, which is a very easy place to pick up signals. The challenge with the forehead though is that it's very noisy. It's inherently noisy. Every time you speak, it that's also an electrical signal and that gets superimposed onto the EEG. And so in clinical EEG research, that's called an artifact. And so generally what you're trying to do is remove the artifact. Now, if you have a, a wet sensor, 
then some of that artifact can be reduced because your input impedance levels are quite decent. The problem though, if you have dry sensors in the case of most consumer products, is that you're eliminating a lot of data. Every time you blink, that's a bad data. And the, the sensor itself takes time to settle again in order to get clean signals. And so for that reason, we've really spent a lot of time developing proprietary sensor technology that is unique to this sort of very peculiar type of biosensing. In that case, we haven't gone out to an ODM and a, a contract manufacturer and said, hey, can you manufacture this for us? We've actually gone out and created our own facility in order to produce these sensors in order to hold the IP ourselves. Um, and as a system, it has to be engineered as a system. It's a mechanical design, it's active sensing, circuitry, it's and the electronics. It's, it really has to be an entire system. So I think in our particular case, there's, a, is, there's definitely a lot of IP that's defensible, but it's not, um, it's because of, you know, the, we also introduced like a nine axis inertial sensor. That's not proprietary. The electronics for that is very simple, right? You just integrate it because it's affordable and it gives you more data. But this particular EEG based sensing is very, very, very much um, unique. Uh, we don't worry about knockoffs either. I mean, uh, we have a lot of deep IP on our biomechanical model, um, our ability to be able to know where your body is in space, and um, to also, for the sensor to be able to calibrate appropriately based on the use case to normalize. And so there's just a lot of, um, it, again, it's not so much about the data signals, it's what you do with the data and how you turn that data into meaning. And that's hard to knock off. In, in our case, it's kind of interesting. There's roughly about over 25 companies in the head-mounted display arena. The most notable is Oculus. Second is the Sony Morpheus, et cetera, et cetera. The Carl Zeiss has a device. They all have a device. Guess what? They all have a screen all up against your eye. We have no screen. We use basically a nano LED that goes and bounces off two million micromirrors and we beam light directly to your retina. We are the only virtual retinal display company. It is a very, very hard science problem mm. to solve. We also do not manufacture our lens, lens capabilities in a single place. We manufacture in two separate places. They ne no single manufacturer in our chain knows what the other does. So uh, we think we have very defensible products. That said, you know, you know, you would, everybody would, would be a fool to say what 10,000 engineers in, in China can't do. I, I, wouldn't, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past anyone. The other thing that makes our system defensible is there is only one source of the DLP mirrors in the world and that's Texas Instruments. Texas Instruments knows the IP belongs to us. They know that for the near eye display business that we are the holders of all of those patents. So those are the things that I think give us some level of defensibility. With regards to the audio, there's only three manufacturers of audio sets in the, pla in the planet. And guess what? They're all the same. And there's not a lot to defend in audio per se, but what we can defend is the form factor, the click down, the click up. We hold very strong patents on that one. Hmm. Okay. Um, so, Manisha, earlier you had said that you wanted to talk a little more about pre-sales and Kickstarter. Um, I have a few questions. Again, coming more from an internet uh, startup focused background. Uh, with pre-sales, do you have any broad advice for anyone considering using Kickstarter, self-starter, anything like that? Um, how far out can you set your shipping window reasonably with consumers? Mm -hmm. And then in case you don't hit your, your funding goal, can you actually refund the money and sort of still start over or are you done? So a few questions in there just around. Sure, so we've done both Kickstarter and our own um, crowdfunding campaign for our first product, LumoBack, which is also a posture and activity tracker, but it has a different form factor. It's worn around the waist. We did a Kickstarter campaign and raised about $200,000. And it was a great learning experience. We exceeded our goals, learned how to kind of get a, a crowdfunding campaign going. With the second time when we knew we wanted to do another campaign, we realized you know, we really want to be able to understand the experience of the user on our website. We want to be able to 
you know, do heat mapping so we know what parts of the website are resonating with them versus not. We wanted to be able to try out different messaging. We wanted them to have an experience that was consistent with our brand, right? And when you do it on a third party crowdfunding um, site, you, you give a lot of that up. Uh, plus the fact that you're driving traffic to a website that's not yours. Um, plus the fact that you give, you know, certain percentage, percentage commission. A lot of money. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, on the flip side, I mean, you know, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, they offer a huge audience, right? That if you are at a stage, you know, for example, with our first crowdfunding campaign, we didn't yet, we weren't yet at that stage where we could access that, that type of audience on our own. And so for the first time, it definitely made sense to do Kickstarter. But the second time, you know, we had a little bit more of a marketing muscle on our team. We have a really great online marketing guy, you know, who was able to help us figure out how to drive traffic to our website so that they could convert for the crowdfunding campaign um, or the pre-order campaign, I guess, as it were. So there's pros and cons. Uh, we've done both and we feel like, you know, Kickstarter was appropriate for that first stage of our company and doing it on our own uh, was appropriate for this more recent stage. Now, uh, how far out did you set your, your, when you started the campaign, when did you say you would ship? I mean, I think with, with uh, Avagon, it's what, nine months away? December uh, yeah. was the target date. Yeah. Um, with us, the interesting thing about cr crowdfunding, the price of your product matters a lot. Only of the people who converted and bought, in, uh, and bought stuff or supported us, right? Less than 15% came from Kickstarter. Most of the people who actually went and bought in, and we did our own analytics, actually came from third party sites. They actually came from Snoop Dogg. They actually came from CNET. They actually came from uh, stories in Forbes, stories from the, new, um, you know, you know it, it was the, the conversion from the native conversion, Kickstarter only, it was only like 15%, you know? Most of them were for third party. Mm -hmm. um, also, we felt we could have done better, but we couldn't price the product less than 500. It, was, it would be stupid. We didn't want to start a company where our first business model was, let, let's lose some money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when you're asking $500 from somebody, that's, that's a lot of money. Mm. I think you're right. I think the timing from a Kickstarter campaign until the proposed estimated delivery ought to be around the six to nine month time frame. Um, and what we found with most Kickstarter campaigns, and I've been a backer of many campaigns, is that most Kickstarter backers back the idea and so they're comfortable with waiting and they understand that with hardware in particular, there will be delays, often to the tune of three six, nine months, but once you've passed that sort of outer edge of the, the nine months, and I, I know some friends who, who delivered past the nine months of the expected delivery date, that's when people get very, very angry and your supporters become your worst nightmares, mm -hmm. right? And so... <laughs> that's only about five, by the way, just five supporters who will be very angry. Yeah. And, but they're going to be very loud. But they're very vocal. <laughs> and so I think what's Im really important is you... The, the way, when we talk to um, the folks at Indiegogo about doing crowdfunding, one of the most salient advice that they gave us was the fact that if you want to raise a crowdfunding campaign, $100,000 is a lot of money for crowdfunding. And so that should be the litmus test as to how much more money you need in order to finish your product and to get it out to market. If you haven't done the groundwork in sufficiently so that you only need about $100,000 to deliver, then it's too early. And so that's how much effort you need to be able to put into the, hard and hardware is hard. You're, in most cases, you have to spend a lot of money and time and investment up front to do the legwork, to do the hard work, and then when you are at that $100,000 sweet spot campaign, so you can show a prototype, you can show some working demos, you can show software that's functional uh, and how the product interacts, that's when you're gonna raise you know, a million dollars because the, the community is captivated by that, you know, that product. It's exciting at that point and it doesn't, the risk, you've taken out the risk for them, just like a VC, right? You've taken out the development risk or at least the perceived development risk. So sure there's some manufacturing risks um, that is still embedded in a hardware fulfillment um, 
uh, a process, but I think think about it in that in, in those terms if you're considering uh, hardware. You can't uh, by the way, I want to add for us, Kickstarter also was an, we love Kickstarter, but it was not the event that really drove the money. We did a road show. We went to 18 cities and had open, you know, come open, touch the device, you know, we had them play with it, touch it, feel it, and these people, our supporters, actually said, yes, the device is real, yes, it's an early stage prototype, but it is the real deal. Mm -hmm. That was what, to me, was the most important thing we did, mm -hmm. to actually let our customers and supporters touch and feel the product. So uh, we're going to take questions in about um, two minutes. I have one or two more questions, so start thinking of your own. Um, Yobi, I want to pick up on one thing you said, which is you had to set the price at five hundred dollars because it would be, you know, it would be irrational or silly to, to charge below that, uh, given your your bill of materials, your bomb cost, and, and kind of your servicing, shipping. Um, in in a lot of internet businesses, it actually makes sense to acquire users unprofitably because you're building a network, and then you sort of have this moat around your business. Um, do you all, uh, in your own businesses or in any other hardware businesses, any other wearable business, do you see any network effects where it would ever make sense to sort of go unprofitable at the beginning because later on your asset will be worth a lot more and, and then you can acquire? I, look, at a higher look I mean, um, you know, I love Paul Merlucky over at Oculus, right? Oculus has never been profitable. They've sold 50,000 units. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I guess my point is on each unit, they charge, I think they charge more than their bill of materials. Oh. So it never makes sense to sort of really dig in with the goal Absolutely. of Absolutely. I know that, that you could do that, but I, I don't know. Maybe I'm old school because I used to run Ernst & Young globally, <laughs> you know, and you got to have a profit. I mean, this notion of this, okay, I'll sell it for cheap, wait till I hit volume, 100,000 100, units a month, 200,000 units, mm -hmm. and then manage down the bomb, mm -hmm. the bomb numbers. I think it it sets a dangerous precedent, at least from our point. We have an extremely complex product. We have three optical systems, we have gearing systems, mm -hmm. we have audio, we have electronics, we have processors. It's an extremely complex product to build. Mm -hmm. And we simply could not find it, uh, could not find a business reason to go and say, okay, man, let's sell it below cost just to, just to acquire customers. We couldn't find it. I, I'm not so sure if, my, my two colleagues here. Mm -hmm. I think it boils down to philosophically what kind of um, entrepreneur you are. Um, for me, it's really important to be able to control my own destiny. And that means getting to profitability ASAP and getting to the point where any future financing that I have, it's because I want to raise that money, not because I have to. Now, certainly that's hard at this stage, right? But I feel like if you start with smart economics from day one, um, with an eye on getting your company to profitability as soon as possible, um, you just have a much better chance of controlling your own destiny. Now having said that, I do think there are a lot of opportunities um, in terms of revenue models along the lines of subscription services. And that is something we're exploring. And as we gain confidence in our ability to monetize through subscription services, we will bring down the initial cost of the product. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I want to be confident that that other revenue stream is there, because again, boils down to controlling our own destiny. It's something you have to consider with hardware businesses as well, is that your process for iteration, every incremental product you sell is a cost. There's an inventory cost, a production cost, a packaging cost, and a fulfillment cost. It's not like software, you build it once, and you can iterate a little bit, you can get it out, get people to try it. Your incremental cost in the, that case is very, very different to a hardware business. So hardware businesses don't scale in that way. It's not conducive to that sort of um, model. And so I've never found it to be a prudent business value proposition. And the other thing is when you're trying to create a new segment that's very exciting, you don't necessarily need to. It's not a commodity that we're selling, you know? We're selling the, the excitement of being able to track you and, and measure and do fun stuff with your brain. It's, it's, a, it's a premium product. There's no need to turn it into a commodity 
today. Mm -hmm. And so I think for some, and same thing I think with Avagant, you don't need to do that today because it is a premium product. People want that experience and they're willing to pay a premium for it. So why would you um, give it out for free in the hopes that you'll be able to get a network effect? Mm -hmm. Considering that your business model is very different inherently, right? Intrinsically, it's a very different proposition. And so it, it doesn't make sense. Um, are there any questions in the audience? Uh, yes, please. What was your methodology for arriving at the price point? Like $500 or $200 a month? Yeah, well, uh, the question is what was the methodology for arriving at the price point? You go, uh, it's fairly simple for us. We look at the total bomb cost, the total cost of delivery, the total cost of inventory, how much inventory we need to hold, what's the cash to cash. Uh, you know, Matt, cycle. There, there, there's a whole bunch of factors. It's not just what is your bill of materials. It's not that simple. Cash to cash management is actually probably more critical than bill of materials. Yep. Um, right you know, on. because that's how you rotate. You don't really want inventory. Let's mm -hmm. let me put it to you that way. The inventory is death. <laughs> you know, as, as far as I'm concerned. Right. Exactly. Same. Same for us. For us, um, we learned a lot from the launch of our first product, Lumobath, which we priced at the price of 149. And what we learned is um, 149 is a small price to pay for somebody who has back pain, and the motivation level of you know what they're willing to pay is very high. I mean, they're already buying special cushions and back braces and chairs and mattresses. Um, but what we learned is for the consumer that's more motivated by you know, improving their slouching, they, they have the forward shoulders, they want to improve their image, they want to look more confident, they want, want to look more attractive, that's really more of a mass consumer market. And anything over $100 for the mass consumer market is a barrier. And so that's when we get challenged ourselves with the uh, design of Lumo Lift, is how can we make it more appealing for the mass consumer market, not only in terms of design, but also in terms of price point. Um, and so as we looked at the redesign and in the bombs and things like that that had to go in, um, we were able to make it work so that it could be sold at a sub $100 price point. Uh, within that, we even did a lot of price testing as well. You know, and, and what we found is for what works within the economics of our product, um, $99 is, is the sweet spot. Hmm. Good. Uh, any other questions? Um, I have one for Yobi. Um, so if I ever wear glasses and I kind of put them on my head, um, they get smudged. So I'm curious with the Avagon Glyph, you know, when you're looking at it and you sort of put it up under your head to listen to music, how do you handle sort of all sorts it of stuff? It actually has a cap. Head? Yeah, it comes with a, with a lens cover. You okay, just so every time you take it off, you put the lens cover you back just, on? Yeah, you, there's just a lens cover. It's pretty straightforward. You okay. know, it's just an accessory. You go like click, that's okay. it. And then so it's covered. The unique thing about the Avigan with regards to the lens mechanism, by the way, is that you don't need your glasses. It works from plus two to minus eight. Wow. Okay. So you do not need your glasses, your contact lenses, or anything. 